life is filled with um, paradoxes. A paradox is a statement that seems to contradict itself and yet expresses a valid truth or principle. Um, if you've heard of William Shakespeare, he, uh, he had an immeasurable influence on English language. And he introduces a powerful paradox in his famous writing, um, Hamlet. And uh, in, in, his, uh, in Hamlet, he gives a statement known as a paradox. It says, I must be cruel only to be kind. That is the paradox that is given. Maybe you've heard of George Orwell, his uh, political allegories in two of his most famous books, 1984 and Animal Farm, both political allegories um, talking about communism. And um, he gives a, uh, he starts off in the book with a uh, powerful paradox. He says, all animals in, in Animal Farm, all animals are created equal, but some animals are more equal than others. For Shakespeare, Hamlet is communicating that he does evil for the ultimate good. For all you Marvel nerds, think Thanos, right? <laughs> it's like, I, I'm trying to do a world a favor by killing half the, half the galaxy, right? Um, it's this idea that for the better good, I must do bad things. And we kind of talked about that a few weeks ago in our message on how that, unfortunately, that's a truth that many people try to live by. And then for the pigs in Animal Farm, um, it's the lie that one group is more equal than others. It's, it's basically the moment in the book that he's trying to elude that something's not right on the farm. There's trouble luring or, or kind of brewing on the farm. Um, those are what's called logical paradoxes. They're paradoxes that defy all earthly logic. There's also what's called literary paradoxes. Paradoxes. It's a statement that actually reveals a deeper meaning. Maybe you've heard of a paradox known as less is more. Anybody ever heard of that paradox? You have to spend money to make money. Anybody ever heard that? Um, the only rule is there are no rules. Come on, somebody. Um, both force you to look deeper into the saying and decipher a truth for life. It's a meaning behind the saying. Jesus was a master at this. Jesus went about his entire life, and in three and a half years of ministry, he did things where he taught with parables. He taught with miracles. He taught with just his everyday life, how he lived his life. But Jesus uses paradoxes. In fact, in, in Mark chapter 10, you see five paradoxes in the entire chapter. Here are those five paradoxes. He goes, he talks about two shall become one. Uh, he says that adults shall be children. He says the first shall be last. Servants shall be rulers and the poor shall be rich. If you go and read the entire chapter, you'll see that in every encounter, Jesus presents a paradox. And what you'll find, especially as now we are gearing our, our journey through Mark, where he is a, he's about to enter holy, what we know as Holy Week. He's about to head into Jerusalem for his last week before his arrest, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. What you'll see often is that Jesus will give a teaching, and then a moment will happen after that teaching that he'll actually manifest it in front of the disciples. And which is what makes his story with the disciples so funny is because, like, he'll teach them something. They're like, yeah, yeah, that's right. And then he does it, and they're like, we don't understand. <laughs> and, like, he has to keep coming back, and, you know, like, guys, are you paying attention? Like, it's been three and a half years. What are we doing here, right? And what Jesus is trying to reveal to us is this, is that Jesus is a contrasting king. Jesus is a contrasting king. In fact, Jesus himself is a paradox, right? Here he is. We've, we've already revealed that he is the Messiah, which means he is a royal king. But here is a royal king who is also a servant. 
Here is God, but he's also human. Here is the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he's also the lamb of God. Here is a sinless man who dies as a criminal. Here is the Savior, but he also must suffer. Contrasting. What Jesus tends to do throughout his teachings is that he is a, the ultimate paradigm buster. And what I know is that many of us have formed our theology, we have formed our way of life around paradigms. And paradigm is simply just the way that you see or view the world. It is a way of thinking. And all of us, our way of thinking was shaped by our childhood experiences, our teenage experiences. Our experiences in life tend to shape our paradigms. And what Jesus always did was basically confront people in their own experiences of saying, like, you can shape your life around your experiences, but when you do that, you tend to walk away from the truth of God's word. But when I shape my experiences around my theology of who I believe God is and who I believe Jesus is, then things begin to look a little bit different. And the problem is most of us have tried to follow Jesus through a world paradigm. And when you do that, at the end of the day, you're going to come to a moment in your life where you realize that Jesus you've been following does not line up with the way you've been living. Are y'all with me so far? And so what we've got to ask ourselves is what is the deeper truth Jesus is trying to communicate? And how should these paradoxes shift my own paradigm? How should it shift my own perspective? Because what I want you to know is that when you fail to receive the contrast, you will ultimately reject the Christ. And you have to be able to receive the contrast of that his kingdom is different than the kingdom of this world. And we have to be able to view it through the king's eyes. So a couple of things about this text that we're going to dive into. Number one is this. The rich young ruler had a shallow view of salvation. He had a shallow view of salvation. Now here's what's interesting about this story. This man comes running up to Jesus and he says, good teacher. Now this is an odd exchange because if you're just looking at this from the surface level, you kind of miss what's really happening here. In their culture, in their day, rabbis refused to be called good. Like you were not allowed to call a rabbi good. And so in this moment, it seems like Jesus is almost denying his deity, but it's not really what's happening. What's happening is this man is trying to flatter Jesus by calling him good. And Jesus is reminding him, like, you know nobody's good but God, right? And so the number one mistake this man makes is that he does not address him as Lord. He addresses him as a teacher. And so his whole, par his whole paradigm and his perspective is off from the beginning. Because for some people, this goes back to our sermon two weeks ago, ultimately what determines how you live your life is how you answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? And for this man, he was just this guy who was the teacher of, this, of the word that could hopefully give him some insights on how to live the best life possible. Sound familiar? It sounds like our day today where we're looking for some sort of motivational speech or motivational speaker to give us the 10 keys to success in the world, right? That's ultimately what this man was looking for. He starts off by saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He's looking for some sort of, if I do this, I will receive this. It's the common belief that has not changed for thousands of years. It's the common belief that if I stack enough good deeds, more than my bad deeds, then somehow I will have favor with God. It's the ultimate exchange. If I do good, I am good. And what Jesus is trying to make him understand here is the issue is bigger than that. He must see his sin as bigger than just doing wrong. It is an inward attitude, an inward posture. And in this moment, he thought that he could settle his own sin account with a check. And I wonder how many of us think that we can settle our own sin account with good deeds or church attendance or how many times we 
how many days in a row we have in reading our devotional on you version, right? And so in this moment, we have this shallow view of salvation. It's more of a transaction base. Now, we aren't too far from this because most of us have grown up with this type of gospel. It's what's called the, the, the simple gospel or the evangelical gospel. And what's interesting about this type of gospel, it's the gospel that says, listen, you got to know that you're a sinner. you got to pray this prayer. And if you'll pray this prayer, then you punch a ticket and you get to go to heaven one day after you die. That is the simple, simplified version of the gospel that we've been shared. And here's what you may not realize is that this version of the gospel has really only been around since post-World War II. It's not saying that it's necessarily wrong. It's just incomplete. And what happened post-World War II is that many people are like, we need to start, how do we get the masses into heaven? How can we simplify this to the very bottom thing to where like the, the, the base layer thing that you have to do is just repeat a prayer after me. And then one day when you die later, after you've done living your life up here, I don't know what's going on. Is that better? Can I get in this? All right. Is my mic messing up? All right. I was like, all right, Doug, you're about to play a little ditty behind me or something. I don't know. Um, where was I? Anyways, uh, this simple gospel. And so it's incomplete. So it has a, a high view of a transaction, a low view of transformation. A high, it also coincides with the second American gospel, which is the reform gospel. And the reform gospel is very high education, very low encounter. And so while these things aren't bad in themselves, they're incomplete. And what most of us grew up is saying, like, hey, I just need some sort of transaction to know that I'm good. Now I can go about living my life. And you actually don't start following Jesus. You just said a prayer, punched a ticket, but you actually don't know what it means to live with eternal life. Here's what's, here's what's incredible about this moment when he says, when he's talking about eternal life. Eternal life is not quantitative, it's qualitative. What most of us think, most of us think that eternity starts after you die. You are in the middle of eternity right now. Time doesn't somehow, there's not like a clock that Jesus is waiting to start the clock whenever you die. The clock is ticking right now. You're in the midst of eternity. And what Jesus is saying is like he's come to bring life abundantly. He's come to bring eternal life. It's actually a quality of life. He's saying you can have eternal life now. This peace, this joy, this freedom from sin and death. When you understand that salvation is not just you punching a ticket to heaven, it is victory over sin, death, and hell. And that victory leads us toward a different life. When I repent, it's not, hey, I'm going to make a prayer and then I'm going to keep going. Repentance is actually going, I am heading the entire wrong way. Everything about my life is postured toward myself. I must turn my life toward the life and teachings of Jesus. And the result of this simple gospel is we have a biblically illiterate generation that has grown up in the last 40 to 50 years where reading the Bible is not a priority and knowing God is not a priority. You realize the fruit of salvation is union with God. Not just pardon from all the bad things that you've done. And this person was wanting, how, how, do, I, how do I get to this, this, this place of favor? And here's what's, here's what's fascinating about this encounter with Jesus is that in his heart, he was really looking for Jesus to almost affirm him in front of everybody else. He's like, man, watch this. I bet he's going to just really just be amazed at how good of a person I am. And in, in reality, most of us, that's what we're looking for when it comes to our life in Christ. We want affirmation for our life more than we want transformation from who we really are. And so in this moment, we forget that it focuses on sin management. You know what this gospel does too? This gospel makes us, forces us to live a life of minimalism. And what I mean by that, not in a good way, in a bad way. It's basically what is the minimal that I need to give to this relationship and still make it to heaven. And none of this is in the Bible. Like none of this is the real gospel. It's incomplete. 
the goal is union with God, relationship with him, knowing him. In fact, Colossians 3 says to be, he says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Imagine you got married. You sign the paper, you're at the altar, and then the next day you're like, listen, I just need to know what are like the 10 things you need me to do and us still stay married. Because, like, I, I mean, I got things I got to do, you know. I mean, I, I know we got married, but I'm still, like, me and my boys are still going to go hang out. We're still, like, that's, that's a problem in marriage. Most of you don't realize you are entering a covenant that changes who you, who you are. It's actually one of the purest forms of the gospel. It's actually a reflection of, of what it's like to live a selfless life. And the reason why some of you, your marriage don't last longer than three years because you're still trying to be a bachelor while you have a ring on your finger but that's what it's like for some of us following Jesus. We're just saying, like, God, what's the, what's the ten minimal things that I need? What's, and we start, we start asking questions like, well, is it wrong for me to do this? Or what's, what, what's, what's, the, what's, the, what, what's the barrier or the boundary for this? Instead of saying, how do I know Jesus more and become more like him? Do you see the difference? And the problem is most of us are just too good to follow Jesus. You don't need Jesus because you think your behavior is okay because you think you you can stack up enough good deeds to earn favor. That is a shallow view of salvation. Number two, this rich man, he had a surface level view of the law. He had a surface level view of the law. I find it fascinating that when he asks about eternal life, and here's the thing, Jesus knows our hearts, and he was getting to the heart of this man in this moment. And there's a reason why he points him to the law. And the reason why he points him to the law is because he hopes that as he looks at the law, he will find out real quick that he is a sinner. That I cannot keep these. I cannot do this on my own. And it's fascinating because did you notice that Jesus only mentions the commandments that include some sort of action. You notice he didn't give all ten and it's almost like this cat and mouse game that he's playing with this guy. He's like, I'm going to mention these and see, I'm going to see if he actually brings up the other four. And did he? I can almost imagine as he's listening to him, he's like, yeah, yeah, that's one. Yeah, two, three, four. Oh, he didn't mention those other four. Yeah, I, I've done those. I'm not going to mention the other four because the one that he left out was covet. Actually, he leaves out the four that have more to do with our internal posture towards God and towards people than he does an actual action. And if we're honest, most of us grew up with a form of the gospel that is all about what is doing something to earn God's favor. Doing something. And in this moment, he's reminding him that the law cannot change your heart. In fact, the whole purpose, even Paul talks about this. He says the law actually works as a mirror. That when I look into the law, I go like, man, I'm not that kind of person. I, I, I actually do covet. I actually have used the Lord's name in vain. I have been dishonest. I have stolen. And it's this reminder that the law is a mirror that cannot wash you. And the law brings the sinner to Christ, but it cannot make the sinner like Christ. Only grace can do that. No one goes to the bathroom and looks in the mirror and goes, man, I need to wash my face. And then starts rubbing their face against the mirror. How many of you know to get the face clean, you have to go to a, a different source? And Jesus is reminding him, I'm going to show. Basically, Jesus holds up a mirror and says, what do you think? <laughs> I look good. That's basically what his response was. And Jesus was trying to get him to see that his heart was still far from him. You see, his question about the law brought him to Jesus. Don't miss this. But Jesus' response to him did not bring him to repentance. Sometimes that's what it's like coming to church every week. God is showing you a picture of a reflection of your life and how it's different than the life that he's come to offer. And man, you can come to the mirror, but he cannot make you wash. 
he invites you to come to the living water. You see, this man measured his obedience by his external actions instead of his internal attitudes. His external actions seemed blameless, but his heart was covetous. And so he does this. He says, listen, do, he leaves out the whole internal stuff. And here's what's amazing. This man walks away sad. And here's what I can't get past every time I think about this moment between this man and, and Jesus. Is what the man heard was, go give up all your stuff. But what he should have heard was, come be with me. And I'm telling you, some of the, the largest gaps between you and a life in Christ is that you hear the wrong gospel. What you hear is all the things you're going to lose. I'm going to be honest. I, can't, I got saved at 18. I thought for sure my life was over. And it was. Don't get me wrong. I had to die to self. But I mean like in all the superficial ways. I'm like, well, I'm not going to have any friends. Um, I'm not going to ever listen to good music again. I, have to give up, I had to give up my Bone Thugs and Harmony, my Tupac, my Dr. Dre. You know, it's, I guess you know, I had to give up Dre for the Gaither Vocal Band. You know, like... <clears throat> and around that time, like, Christian music was just coming up. So it was like Gaither Vocal Band and DC Talk. You know, like, it was like, and that was pretty edgy. You know, like, the, the pastor didn't like us listening to DC Talk or Audio Adrenaline, you know. And uh, I just remember, like, I'm probably going to have to marry a, a woman that doesn't wear makeup and wears a dress down to her toes, and we're going to have to make our own butter and all this stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm being facetious, but can we be honest? Like, that's... There's a level of the gospel that we have received that says, you know what, I'll put that off until I'm almost close to death. That way I can actually enjoy life. And the reality is you're missing out on life. Because he says, I've come to give eternal life in the here and now. And it's funny, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day, and she was like, you know, ever since I said yes to Jesus, this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. She's like, I just don't know. And I said, do you think those things might have still happened even if you hadn't said yes to Jesus? Why is it that we blame Jesus for the things that we lose or the things that we walk through? When in reality is when you have Jesus, you get to see it through a different light now. And so I would rather walk through something really hard with a Christ-centered worldview than to walk through it anyways and not have any clue about the eternal life that Christ has to offer. And so for many of us, that's where we're at. A follower of Jesus realizes there is no loss in the light of the Savior. Gaining is losing, and losing is gaining. It's the paradoxical kingdom. It's opposite. In Mark 10, 22, he says, the Bible says, he went away sad. That word is translated grieved. It actually, in the Greek, it means storm clouds. That was the condition of his heart. He literally walked away from the sun into the storm. Back to his riches. And the condition of his soul was darkened. He wanted salvation on his own terms and walked away disappointed. And if we're honest, that's why most of us are disappointed with our faith. It's not because Jesus is disappointing. We're just disappointed that Jesus didn't work it out the way that we want it. We don't have salvation on our terms. We don't have eternal life on our terms. We don't have the blessed life on our terms. You're trying to live for this kingdom. You want, you want the kingdom of God without the king. Or you want to pay homage to a king but not live in his kingdom. And that's the average nominal Christian. Even the disciples were shocked. This should have like, this should tell us something. That even their paradigm is getting blown right here. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's, let's, let's back this up. This guy's young, so obviously he's favored by God. Because in our in this world, we worship youth. Like anybody seen Cher lately? I don't want to go there. That's just, it's scary, right? Sorry, I just got a really dark. Ugh. All right. We worship youth. He's rich. He's got money. Worship that. And he's a ruler. He's got power. Everything 
that would tell the world, this guy has it. And Jesus says, that guy just missed it. And they're like, what? What? And they're like, whoa, 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 Jesus, back this up. Talk to us about this. And then he has this powerful moment with the disciples, right? Because they, just like us, believed that wealth was a sign of God's favor and blessing. And can I tell you, Peter's response was actually an indicator of something in his own heart. Look what he says in verse 28. He says, Peter began to speak up. We've given up everything to follow you. Now know this, in the NASB version, it actually says this. He, it says that Peter asks a question. He says, what will we get? In other words, like, man, we, we have left this stuff behind. So what's in it for us? Even his heart was not all the way in the right place. And Jesus has to have this moment where, number three, we see that they had a commercial view of the Christian life. He's saying, we've given up everything. Now what do we get? That's just like us. We're like, what must I do and what will I get? That's our attitude a lot of times. Hey, Jesus, before I say this prayer, I just need to know. What will I get? What must I do? What will I get? What must I do? And some of us don't even take time to get those questions answered. You get those answered afterward. Because you think, okay, now I got in the tank, I said the prayer, so now, like, what must I do? Well, let me tell you. Okay, well, not those things. What, what else can I do? Not that, not that, not that. What else can I do? Some of y'all have been swiping right on Jesus for years. That wasn't even my notes. Mm, not that, mm, not that, mm, not that. That looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. No, not that. Years. And it's because we have a shallow view of salvation, we have a surface level view of the law, and we have a commercial view of the Christian life. It's what's also known as one of the four American gospels known as the prosperity gospel. And here's what the prosperity gospel leads you to, to, is that the goal becomes our gain instead of God's glory. I think most people live in one of two extremes. They either live in an extreme of not understanding the full kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God is here, but yet it's not all the way here. And so for some of us, it's like, man, you know, if, if you're, it's, it's, we're just going to live in a, a basement until Jesus comes back. The world's not getting any better. We might as well just, you know, put our heads between our legs, kiss our tails goodbye, whatever it may be. Waiting on Jesus, protect my family and no more. Let's not interact with the world. It's what's called dualism. We think that the church is the only place where good happens and the world is evil, when in fact it's what's called common grace. That there is good in the world and there is evil in the church too. Are y'all understand what I'm saying? That's why we've divided categories. We got Christian music, Christian clothing, Christian this. And it's like that's called dualism. The Bible says that God allows the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. It's common grace. Sometimes the people you think are the furthest from God, God's right there at their doorstep waiting for them to turn to him because we judge it from a different standpoint. And then there's an over-exaggeration of the kingdom. This is where the prosperity gospel comes in. And this is where you have, I'll never forget the story. It was a famous church where one of the worship leader's children passed away. She was like a two-year-old. And they left the body in the hospital for seven days praying that God would resurrect it, believing for the resurrection. And they refused to let the body go to the morgue. And, man, what a heartbreaking moment that they forget that the resurrection is not in this life, but it's in the life to come. It's an over-exaggeration. Some of us live in the two extremes, but to live with a healthy view understands that, man, this world, this life in Christ is not for my gain. It is for his glory. And so what we have are a lot of personality-driven churches and ministries, the cult of personality. It's, it's the, i got to find a church that will exalt my gifts, that will exalt my purpose. I, man, that, that, that phrase has been so overkilled in this generation where I'm just trying to find my purpose. Your purpose is to know God, to love him and to know him and to obey him. From that will flow things that Christ will give you to do in your life. And so you spend 30 years thinking you don't have a purpose when your purpose was to be in that word every day, knowing the heart of the Father, letting your image be transformed to the image of Christ, becoming a person of agape. 
look what he says. He says, he assures them that anyone who follows him, this is where it gets weird. Like if you're like the very literal person or actually person, some of y'all get that. He says, I assure you that everyone who's given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children for my sake, notice this, for whose sake? Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel will receive now in return a hundred times as many houses. Claim it in the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters. And like they want to claim the houses, but how many how many people are going like, give me thousands of brothers and sisters and mothers? Like, this is weird if you take it literally, but what is he saying? He says, You're going to be provided for in this life and the life to come. Because guess what? You're always going to have a place to stay. When he says you're going to have many houses, it doesn't mean you're going to own a bunch of houses. He means you're never going to go without a dwelling place. Why? Because the community of Christ is all over the world, and we are to show hospitality. And so you're always going to have somebody who says, hey, come stay with me. You have a roof over your head. Because remember, Jesus did not have a roof over his head. He's saying, that, man, guess what? Now when you come to Christ, man, you're always going to have family. Thank you, Jesus. At least for some of us that don't choose to be orphans. And then he's saying, like, man, it's going to be provided. But then he says this. It, when, Peter's like, what will we get? Jesus is like, I'll tell you. Hatred. Persecution. For some of you, death. Not really the selling point we're looking for, right? And that's the part of the gospel that we don't want to share. But it's a paradox because we understand as followers of Christ, death leads to life. So how do we apply this practically? Number one, I want you to know the gospel you live in is the gospel you live out. If you live in that very transaction-based gospel, you will have a high view of salvation but a low view of discipleship. You will have a high view of church and Christianity but a low view of death to self. And it's, we cannot have one without the other. Salvation is not just for horrible people. It's for all the honest and humble people. You see, you don't have to be an, a quote-unquote bad person to need Jesus or to need salvation. You just have to be an honest person. That your heart posture, your inner attitudes are not bent towards following him. They are bent towards following yourself. And your own desires. It's for the person who admits they're a sinner. Not because they've done something bad, but because they know their heart is not right. How many of you know living, to, living your life to manage sin is exhausting? That's what the simple gospel tells you to do. Just manage your sin. You did a bunch of stuff bad th this week? Hey, it's okay. Do some good stuff on Sunday. Show up to church at least. Got the gold stars, right? And it's bigger than that. Jesus said he came to save those who know they are sick. It's saying, God, I know that without you, I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. You see, salvation is available to everyone, but it's not appealing to everyone. It's truly not. Not in the purest form of the gospel. Sure, everyone wants to, quote, unquote, go to heaven, whatever that means. But most of us don't ask ourselves, what does that mean for my life now? Now. You see, the mark of salvation is union with God, healing for your soul, joining a multi-ethnic family and community of brothers and sisters across the world. It's becoming a person of agape, unconditional love. It's more involved than just a simple transaction. A transaction happens, absolutely. But it's deeper than that. It's incomplete. There is a transformation that must take place. Number two, last but not least, what possesses me is more important than my possessions. You know what's fascinating about this is that if he would have gotten one of the commandments right, he would have understood that he was a sinner in all of them. You know why? Because coveting causes us to break all our other commandments. 
If you covet someone beside your wife, you'll lust, fornicate, and commit adultery. If you covet stuff, you'll lie, manipulate, and maybe even steal for it. If you covet the influence and power and allure of this kingdom, you'll kill or compromise to get it. You'll worship idols, use God's name in vain, spend all of your time and energy on getting more instead of taking a Sabbath. Are you guys getting this? Some of us, we've just made it a checklist. I didn't murder anybody today. Can't wait to get my crown. He's like, yeah, but you spent your entire week worshiping your own idols, coveting things that weren't yours, coveting for next. You spent so much time consumed about what you want to have, but you didn't spend any time knowing the Savior. If you covet success, power, or stardom, you'll worship the applause and spend more of your life trying to get it from people you don't even like. You know what's fascinating? People also live in the extremes with Mark 10, 21. It says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There is still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. For some people, they're like, see there, you need to sell everything you got. Everybody needs to do it. Every Christian should do it. And it's like, Jesus didn't ask everybody to do that. In fact, there were wealthy people who funded his ministry. Read the Gospels. Mostly women, by the way. And, but the other extreme of the gospel is people to say, oh, that was just for, it was just for that man, nobody else. I heard this quote that I thought was so powerful, that anytime Jesus gave a specific person a command, our first response should be, Lord, is it I? Because maybe, maybe there's somebody in here who is so in love with their stuff that Jesus is saying, get rid of it. I found it fascinating on the night of Jesus' arrest when he said, one of you shall betray me. You know what they didn't start doing? I bet it's Peter. We know how that guy is, huh? Huh? He's rougher than a cob. That's That's what they say in the South. I don't know. You know what they started saying? Lord, is it I? The best way to approach scripture, and listen, some of us, that's what we do, right? We come to church like, I'm taking my husband to church today. And you're like, Lord, it is him. Get him, right? Most of us bring people to church like Jesus is some sort of junkyard dog, you know. Get him, Jesus. If you're reading the scripture and always thinking about what this would mean to somebody else, your heart posture is probably not in a place to receive the kingdom. But when I read the Gospels and I see how Jesus interacts with individuals, I must ask myself, Lord, is that that me? What are you asking me to do in this moment? Do I have a covetous heart? Do I put more faith in my stuff than I do in the Savior? Am I generous? Am I loving? Am I seeking that union with you? You see, I can imagine... Jesus' face as this man walked away. The Bible says he had genuine love for him. I can imagine the brokenness. And you know what Jesus didn't do? He didn't run after him, begging him to turn around, saying, hey, let's, let's negotiate, at least give away half. He let him walk away. Heartbroken. You see, he couldn't get him to see that he desired holistic salvation. His heart, his mind spirit, the entire person, not just for one day when you die, for now. How is he bringing peace to your life? How is he bringing healing from all of your traumatic experiences? How is he forming you into a person of agape, a person of generosity, a person of faithfulness, a person who loves his word and loves his presence? How is that happening in your life? Because if none of that is on the table, then maybe, just maybe, I'm living out a gospel that I believe that wasn't true. You know what's amazing about Peter? We get to see his transformation. I love it. Peter always gets a hard time. You know, they're just like, man, Peter's cussed. Like, I love it when people use the old version of Peter to excuse their behavior now. If Peter cuts off ears, I'm going to tell you something. I'll cut off ears. I'll do it. 
You realize that was before the Holy Spirit, right? When the Holy Spirit came, Peter said, hang me upside down. I'm not worthy to hang like my Savior. He was crucified just like his Lord and Savior. He didn't slice ears. He willingly gave his life. And one of the most powerful transformations. You see this in Mark 10, right? What will we get? What's in it for me? You know what's powerful about Mark or Acts 3, 6? The Bible says him and John were on the way to church to pray. The guy says, hey, you guys have any silver? You got any coin? He says, silver and gold I have none. Don't miss this. But what I have, I give to you. It's the paradoxical kingdom. It's going from what must I do, what will I get, to what do you want from me? And what I have. I give it to you. That's the kingdom Jesus is inviting us into. That's the heart posture. That's the change that begins to happen. Peter's life is radically transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. All the disciples were. They went from ornery, divisive, argumentative, rough nets cowards, fearful, to faithful, gentle yet strong, persevering, bold, courageous, not because they finally did enough good deeds, but because of the power of the Holy Spirit and the transformation of their hearts. It's available. Eternal life is available here and now. And it's not about quantity, it's about quality. Three things I'm going to ask you to pray through as we get ready to respond today. One, and I know, you guys see this every week, right? Repent. Like, if you get tired of hearing the word repent, find another church. Like, this is the, this is the basic first step of the gospel. Some of us need to repent. We do. Even if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you realize there are still moments we need to repent. And you say, God, forgive me for this. I have been walking my own way in this. It's a part of our discipleship. Repentance shouldn't be a one-time thing in your life. It should be a continual thing. Some of us need to make a relationship with repentance. Go ahead and, like, make it a companion every day. Not in a way of, like, oh, God, I'm just a terrible, evil person, but in a way of, like, God, soften my heart. Can I tell you one of the most beautiful things God does is convict us? Because in that conviction, he's saying, man, I love you so much. I loved you to save you right where you're at, but I love you too much to leave you there. And I'm bringing you along with me. Because one of the worst things God could ever do is to allow you to have your way. But repentance means I've come to an epiphany. I am doing this my way, not God's way. I need to turn from my heart posture, my attitudes, my sin and turn towards Jesus. Number two, reveal my inner attitudes and my outer, that shape my outer actions. God, what's really going on in my heart that causes me to be a bitter person? What's going on in my heart that causes me to be apathetic? What's going on in my heart that causes me to be unbelieving? What's going on in my heart that causes me to be lazy spiritually? What's going on in my heart that causes me to be just a jerk to my wife? What's going on in my heart that causes me to be a parent that is so controlling and manipulative but not leading my kids to a place of knowing Christ and becoming like Him? What's going on in my heart that causes me to have a resentment toward my job and my boss? What's going on in my heart that causes me to want substances over the Savior? What's going on in my heart that causes me to want to spend more of my time on my hobbies than I do on actually reading the Word of God and in time in prayer? Are you guys getting where I'm going? Reveal to me, God. Don't just come to Christ, but follow Him. Last but not least, reshape. Reshape my perspective of Jesus. He's not just a good teacher. He is God. He is Lord. He's the King. My perspective of eternity, that it's not something that begins once I die. I'm not just buying time until we get out of here on the favorite rocket ship going through the sky. Sorry, watched a lot of kids' shows. 
my perspective of money and possessions that I don't own anything. I remember I used to hear preachers say, you know what, all God asks is for 10% and you, the rest is yours. 100% of it is his. We just steward it. And if your posture is what little, what's the bare minimum, God? That's why I don't really preach on tithing a lot. You know why? Because when you are a follower of Jesus, tithing is the bare minimum. 10% is actually like the legalistic thing. When you get into the New Testament, they're like, I mean, just generous upon generosity. You'll see people who are in poverty. You see the old woman with the two, two nickels, and she just drops them both in. That's all she had. God changed my perspective on my possessions and my money and changed my perspective of salvation. It is not just a transaction, but it is for my transformation.